Okay, uh, I think we're going to get started efficiently this time, because uh, I think we'll probably have a discussion that might go long. So welcome everyone to this week's very spontaneous discussion on the WMAS uh, and all things EFT. Uh, this is, of course, a response to the data that was reported last week, uh, and also the activity on the archive and the general interest in the field. And uh, the idea here is just to have a very freeform, open discussion, uh, but not total chaos in terms of discussing some of the issues with respect to thinking about this sort of uh, experimental measurement, interpreting it in the standard model effective field theory in particular. Uh, and there'll be a couple of speakers. We are very happy that uh, people at last minute agreed to have a few slides and say a few words. Uh, Tavong, thank you very much. And Signori is also going to uh, join later uh, in this meeting, who's going to talk about uh, an interesting result regarding PT modeling and some issues and concerns there. Um, and I'm just going to give an introduction on some of the basics and uh, some of the basic interpretational issues that I think are lurking here. Uh, so again, if you um, want to uh, uh, comment, if you want to um, uh, uh, discuss a, a particular point that comes up in this discussion, please feel free to, to join in and, and, and speak up, but please do use the raise hand button before you do so, just so we don't have total chaos in terms of people talking over one another. And I hope that my co-organizers can field the hand raising um, and get people uh, able to speak uh, by unmuting them and not uh, as we go through. Okay, so I don't want to go too far and, and go over too long. So let's just get started with a couple of comments um, in terms of interpreting uh, this data in, in this map in the most basic way. So this Measurement, uh, of course, is of interest. Uh, we don't see a specific resonance, so we're just going to interpret this in the effective field theory, uh, and that's what the focus is basically in terms of this discussion. So just to remind the non-experts in the field, when we're doing an effective field theory interpretation like this, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at uh, effects of physics beyond the standard model, hopefully, that is not resonant and that is uh, basically Taylor expanded out and appearing like local contact operators shifting our expectations of what we expect in terms of the standard model pattern. And that uh, in this case is going to be the, uh, the deviation compared to what you expect in terms of the W mass that's been reported last week. Uh, and so it's just a simple Taylor expansion. The heavy mass scale dependence is simplified and people are really looking in the global fits, which we discussed at the dimension six effects, which are perturbing the standard model prediction uh, with a one over uh, heavy mass scale of new physics uh, effect. And in the numerator, it can in general be kinematic invariance, but it's essentially going to be set by the scale of the VEV because of the kinematics of the particular measurement people are thinking about. So the standard model effective field theory is just this Taylor expansion and the leading uh, Lagrangian is what we know in terms of the standard model and people are looking at dimension six projections and interpretations of the data. So uh, the, the, the theory is built up out of long distance propagating states, the standard model states, which are the operators, and then we are fitting to these Wilson coefficients divided by some suppression scale. So the, the leading Lagrangian term, just a fixed notation in the way I'll present it here, is just given by the, 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 the leading term on the, top, on the top of this page. And I'm going to be using, and I think most fitting groups are using the Warsaw basis. And the Warsaw basis, just for your reference, is the uh, first time the operator basis at dimension six was written down in a non-redundant way. And that's this paper in 2010 just listed here. It's called the Warsaw basis because the names are a bit challenging to actually pronounce. Okay, so the SMAF is uh, the kind of uh, a key tool to interpreting a, a measurement such as the one that was reported last week, if it really firms up into a real anomaly. And the reason for that, just, uh, just to remind you, is that any one measurement, of course, uh, is not going to falsify a theory. It'll just fix some parameters in the theory that are usually free parameters. But a pattern of measurements can show a theory does not describe the global data. So we're looking at the pattern. And we're comparing to the standard model pattern. The standard model expectation is just given by the gray band here. And the re result reported last week is significantly deviating from that expectation is the point. So the SMAP allows that deviation to be incorporated in an effective field theory understanding. Uh, and you can still do well-defined field theory. You can calculate loops. You can do subleading corrections and just basically understand what's going on and look for the consistency of, of other data with the, those sort of deviations you're, you think you're finding in this one particular measurement. So the SMEF game plan has always been, we're looking for deviations or ready for deviations, such as what this could possibly be. We find them, we map to the operator forms, as you'll see in the fits and the results Tavong is going to talk about. And then we follow the pattern to the underlying model. That's always been kind of the game plan. When we do that, we need to be a bit careful in terms of how we do that mapping, because we have to also change all the input parameters that define the standard model prediction, which was the gray band on the previous slide. So the example people usually use uh, for this is the muon decay fixing of the VEV. 
that's fixing a coefficient of this local contact operator. And that is fixing now with the higher dimensional operators around. So these higher dimensional operators can shift this uh, local contact operator, which is measured from the data. You want to use that measurement from the data of muon decay to map to 246, the usual dependence on the VEV and the standard model when you make a prediction. But these local contact operators can be around, and they appear in the formulas shifting the W mass. And you just need to basically consistently account for them for your inputs mapping to outputs. So this is hopefully clear. And you'll notice there's flavor indices on these operators. And what a lot of groups are doing are doing flavor symmetric things. And the formulas we'll see in a moment don't have those flavor indices just because there's a flavor assumption that's been assumed combining these operator effects into factors of two. Okay, so what people are doing, uh, just to set the stage for the fit results and to remind and get everyone on the same page, is they're using a set of input parameters like that GF we just talked about, but also other ones like the Z mass and also alpha electroweak. And then they're basically making a prediction for the W mass and comparing against the expectation in the standard model with radiative corrections. So it's probably arguable, but as far as I know, the, we're probably should be setting this paper by Grinstein Omaze in terms of this mass shift prediction. These two operators are exactly the the, what are usually the S and T sort of parameter operators. And as far as I understand, they were the first people to really be thinking about this in a real operator uh, you know, uh, way in terms of electric precision data making these sorts of predictions. This is a bit distinct from the STU interpretations in terms of two point functions, but people can look at the literature and, and basically find the initial reference, but I think it might be this one. The modern results are all over the place and they're a little more complete than this. Well, and uh, they incorporate also all the input parameter shifts. And essentially this is the formula that people are all writing down a flavor symmetric version of the mass shift that you get when you use the alpha input parameter scheme. And uh, then you just predict this result and people are fitting to these Wilson coefficients. Now, of course, you could choose uh, to not use the alpha uh, as an input. You could choose to use the W mass itself as an input. And I'll have a couple of comments on that in a, in a couple of minutes. And if you did that, it would be interesting for people to do that and look for the other deviations that would show up and compare it against other measurements just for look for, you know, sort of other ways this anomaly can be interpreted in terms of it being used as an input and then predictions going elsewhere uh, in terms of the deviations from the standard model expectation. So there's a lot of scheme dependence for that choice, which I just mentioned, the alpha input parameter scheme compared to the MW input parameter scheme. Here's some formulas in terms of the mass shifts. And the important point is that when you do what people are doing is essentially using this alpha input parameter scheme and you basically map onto this uh, mass shift, then you get the formula that was written down before. And uh, if you were to choose alternatively to use the W mass as an input, in particular this measurement, then this shift would be absorbed by definition the value of the W mass used to make predictions elsewhere. But then other things would deviate and it would be the pattern would be consistent as we combine more and more data. But there's, it's important to note there's a lot of uh, input parameter dependence in terms of these interpretations in this map. And it's only by combining more and more data that that gets stamped out. And this is perfectly consistent with the way effective field theories work and what you expect. This is basically in the decoupling theorem of Appelquist and Calzone. And uh, it's uh, it's basically the UV physics that are that are preserving the standard model symmetries being absorbed into the input parameters, which was basically stated exactly in this theorem. So particularly for the W mass, let's just do a lightning reminder of how this works to set the stage for the further speakers uh, and the discussion. So it's a template fit in terms of the Tevatron measurement, and what people are looking for is this kinematic shape here. Uh, this uh, transverse variables are used because the missing energy in the W decay. Transverse mass is defined in this way. The initial papers are back to like the early 80s. I think these are the ones given here. And essentially this feature gives you this kinematic structure in terms of the transverse mass. And that gets then very much stamped out by detector effects. Uh, and the PDFs feed in and all sorts of subtleties in terms of modeling the detector, of course, relevant for the uh, experimental measurement. But for our purposes, in terms of interpreting things in this map, I just want to draw your attention to the overall normalization of this sort of curve. And it has dependence on things like the branching ratio, the decay of the Ws, the coupling here for, for the W to the initial state quarks, and also the masses and setting this, the scale and the normalization, that sort of thing. So this, this is just the semi-analytic understanding of the spectra that people are using to fit this. And the template fits basically very around the mass and basically look for the mass to be consistent with the standard model. The issue with the SMAFT interpretations, which I just want to address for a couple of seconds here, is that there's also other parameters in here that will be predicted in the standard model that can also deviate in the SMAT. And so that's the issue is like, can we actually do drop, draw the inference that we want to draw in terms of a mass shift when we have these other sort of uh, coupling shifts of the W to the fermions around, and also the width shifts that can be around in the SMAT, because we have to keep all the local contact operators if we're doing things consistently. So that's that's indeed the problem. And so it's kind of good news with respect to this uh, this uh, legacy Tevatron measurement. Uh, let me just explain why I think that's good news, but then draw some cautions for combining the data and, and other measurements uh, interpreted in this map. 
So the way we check this in terms of the normalization, if it's interpretable in this map, because we look at this normalization factor, and then this normalization, the I and J or the flavor indices here can shift due to local contact operators, which we just use this partial you know, shift in the W uh, coupling notation and the, the, the K of the W to left on notation, shift in the mass normalization scale, and then shift in the width, which can feed in. So this is an overall normalization shift, which can also happen in the SMAP. And uh, we have to worry about essentially how we're projecting onto the mass parameter shift when these other shifts can also be around. So the width in particular is something that you should worry about, I think, a little bit, because it can also be shifting. And it's not independent from the normalization I just showed you. You can think of those as two vectors in like Wilson coefficient space and decompose the width uh, into this parallel and purple particular direction. This is work that I did with a very good master student who went on to an Oxford PhD, Mikhail Bjorn. He really deserves all, basically all the credit for this sort of thing. Um, and essentially, this decomposition can happen. And then you basically um, are, are are going to float the normalization of this measurement. So some of the width effects that can kind of make it difficult to interpret the W mass measurement can be projected out, but some will still remain. And how much is the problem when those effects remain in terms of interpreting this measurement as a shift in the W mass in this map? So normalization is related to this, this parallel uh, shift in the width by this numerical factor. And it's again, just by doing basis you know, vectors and decomposing things that you can do this sort of analysis. So the good news is just given here, um, it's that essentially what could have gone wrong in terms of interpreting the measurement in terms of shifting, uh, projecting the experimental measurement onto the mass shift, uh, that uh, would have been this like red line here, which is this shifts in the width, causing your inference in terms of how the mass is shifted when you're doing the template fit to be screwed up. It would be just convoluting the interpretation with other sort of SMAFT effects. But this effect is a proportional to the normalization of the data, which is floated in the analysis, and it's true for both of the spectra, that this would have been big trouble. But because they float the normalization of the data, this red uh, part is projected out in terms of the data interpretation. The residual part here, the blue, is still around, but you can see it's well described by at least the old experimental errors. So I think this, this means the old measurements are interpretable in this math pretty cleanly in terms of projecting onto that mass shift. Now, that's also, I think, true with the new measurement, just looking roughly speaking at this sort of analysis uh, with this sort of quoted error. But of course, this is the sort of thing that should be done more carefully by the experimental collaborations to ensure there's no bias in terms of how we're projecting our understanding of this measurement onto a, a mass shift compared to the expectation in the alpha parameter scheme. And this is also, I would note, just a one parameter scan shifting the width around. Uh, you should really do a two-dimensional scan and make sure that the things are stable against these sorts of other sort of effects in this map if we want to interpret it. Uh, out of sight of the standard model, this measurement. So I just have a couple more comments on combinations, and then I'll hand it over to Tuvong, and then people can also engage in more discussion. Um, so one issue that is immediately comes to the fore with the terms of SMAFT interpretations is we want to constrain SMAFT from the data. So which, which measurement should we use, right? So we just, just use the new measurement, which is really exciting, or should we actually combine everything? Of course, you would say, you know, well, well, we should combine everything. We shouldn't bias ourselves in terms of interpretation, but it's a little bit difficult uh, in terms of SMAFT interpretations. Um, in, if you're doing a standard model hypothesis test, then you can just do the combination. It's still very challenging, of course, and the experimentalists are, are very well aware of that, and I'm sure that combination will take a long time to really be done, and it, and it should be done. But then the issue is, is how do we actually do a SMAFT analysis if we want to actually combine the data, what set of data should we combine into the sort of constraints we're inferring about these higher dimensional operator effects? It's not so easy as to just say, throw everything together and just assume everything will be fine. And the reason for that is because you have different sort of inference problems that I was just discussing for the template fits uh, in terms of the other measurements, in particular, the ones at, at lab two. So just to, just to basically say a couple of words on this, so the issue is, is that uh, essentially the, the template fit analysis for in terms of like interpreting the data in the SMAF and it's really stable against the other shifts that can be around in terms of the coupling and the width. If that is, 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 is the, the thing you're worried about, then you, the analysis uh, for essentially uh, LHC, it's a bit different because of PDFs, but it basically follows the same sort of form and also LHCB. So these ones here could be combined if you actually convince yourself that the SMAF bias in terms of the data interpretation is under control. And that's pretty straightforward to do. I would say that's that's fine. But when it comes to the, the LEP2 data, remember that it's these other Feynman diagrams, these other processes that are going on there in terms of fitting the W mass. So a naive combination, uh, you have to be a bit careful. And there's two different things that are actually going on. Some of the data that's reported in terms of the LEP2 data is just really a threshold scan. It's really a near threshold scan. And it's the variation of the threshold scan with respect to the W mass. And it's a function of beta, this beta here 
is basically what is done to organize the expansion. This is from Zeppenfeld in this old paper here. And if you're going uh, near the threshold, then, then essentially what happens is, is that this diagram gets basically projected out. Its threshold is dominated by this Feynman diagram. And then your, your W mass interpretation is pretty clean. You still have to do this sort of careful analysis that I was telling you before in terms of the extra coupling shifts and which shifts that can be around. But you don't have the direct inference problem of the triple gauge coupling vertex. But if you are basically going away from threshold at lap two, then you basically have other inference effects involving triple gauge couplings that you have to worry about. So I would say that these two measurements can be combined very naively into a global analysis in terms of SMEFT interpretations. Uh, and that's pretty straightforward to do, and there's not going to be too much trouble. But these other two here, I just wanted to caution people if they're going to start doing naive combinations, which I think is already starting to happen in some of the FIT results, that these ones I think are reported with a little, a little bit of data domination in terms of like the off threshold region. And then they, if you look at the details of the analysis, the triple gauge couplings are assumed to be standard model-like and which shifts. Again, that's fine if in case of the standard model as the measurement, but if you're talking about interpreting this in the EFT with all the local contact operators, you should not be assuming the local contact operators are zero for the triple gauge coupling vertex. It's kind of an ill-defined thing to do. And also these, these the vertices as well. So you just, I would say that this is not really interpretable in the SMEF cleanly to my knowledge, these, these, these two measurements in global combinations. So I would caution people in global fits of just naively combining those in. So, and essentially it's just the, the point of it's, you're just doing two different things. If you're combining in the standard model, it's one thing. If you're combining in the SMEF, it's, it's something else. Uh, and you should be just careful to do your combination being very clear on what theory you're actually doing the combination for in terms of interpretation. Okay, so I didn't wanna to talk too long. Uh, that is basically just a couple of introductory words uh, to get the discussion uh, kind of uh, on, a, on a common level. And uh, I wanted to basically uh, have uh, Tavong basically talk about the FIT results, but are there any questions or comments first before we go on to the, to the uh, FIT results that Tavong wanted to, to have a present a couple of slides on? Please feel free to speak up if anyone wishes to. Is everybody happy? Okay, if everyone's happy, uh, Tavong, are you there in terms of, uh, I don't see yep. you in the- I'm here, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, so can we make you a co-host so you can share your slides and discuss the results that came out of your fitting group? So let me stop your screen and share mine if it allows me to. Yeah, I will also turn off my video. I think I need to. Did I did my okay? Now I'm seeing you, and I'll turn myself off. So Tavong, can you just discuss uh, and present what you guys have been basically doing in terms of your fit? Go ahead. Okay, so yeah, thanks for uh, asking us to uh, present a bit our SMEFT analysis. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, I only have three slides, so it's just a quick introduction of uh, the main points. This is with Emmanuel A, John, Maeve, Ken, and Veronica. The fit that we do is an update of our previous uh, SMEFT analysis that we made with FitMaker, including electric tie boson Higgs and top measurements with a linear uh, dimension six interference effects. In this case, we focus on the electric Higgs and uh, tie boson in the measurement and neglect the top, and we only assume the flavor universal scenario. So the fit that we do is, uh, if I can change, yes. The fit that we do includes a CDF measurement as the latest update, as well as LHCB that we didn't include before. We also didn't include the, the LEP measurement uh, in our previous combination for uh, the LEP MW. In this case, we, we include all of them. As uh, Mike mentioned, we, we just did a naive combination in the sense that uh, we didn't account for theoretical uncertainties in the SMEF that come from these kind of subtleties in uh, including SMEF effects and biasing the measurements. But uh, what we do take for the combination of the world average in black here is the combination that CDF themselves did with D0 and with LEP. So at least the standard model part in that respect is, uh, is in theory done uh, properly in the standard model by CDF. And then we add Atlas and LHCB uh, naively without taking into account correlations. So we see here clearly the, the pool is uh, very far away from the standard model. And in some ways, maybe uh, the world average is 
a more conservative estimate where we can take that as uh, maybe CDF moving closer to, to the central value or having larger uncertainties would nevertheless still give some tension with the standard model, even perhaps with a better understanding of the experimental measurement. So all experimental uncertainties and uh, combination issues aside, let's just assume that we have some kind of new physics that is pulling away from the standard model. And it's interesting to note that the electric physician does not exclude this possibility, or in other words, it's not in tension with other data, which could have been the case. So the electric position fit to the two parameter ST is shown in the gray, uh, sorry, the orange region here. And this is shown on the right as well in a two, two dimensional plane where you see the contours of the delta MW that it prefers ranges from the 0.4 per mil to 0.8 per mil shift of the W mass in this purple region here when we include CDF. So the two parameter fit is compatible um, at the ST level of uh, this two dimensional parameterization with the new measurements and the potential uh, new physics as well as compatible with the standard model, obviously. It's uh, interesting to ask whether or not this is also the case if we do the analysis in the SMEF more generally, where we allow all the possible combinations of operators to enter in a global fit. And in particular, delta NW will get a contribution from two more parameters. The sign of the shift is uh, rather important as well to get an enhancement of the W mass as opposed to decreasing it, depending on which potential UV completions will uh, generate these operators. The SMEF analysis of uh, allowing all the parameters to vary is shown here, starting from one parameter all the way up to 20 parameters, where we show all possible subsets of one, two, three, and four parameters. So the results are shown here, excluding the W measurements from the fit. So this is the equivalent of the indirect determination in the SMEF instead of the standard model of the W mass, where the gray range in each of these bars denote the allowed uh, range by the data other than W measurements. We see that CHD is in particular um, most compatible with a pool towards higher values. This is the T parameter that we saw on a previous slide. And it's uh, the one that can best explain, in a sense, the new uh, CDF information. But we also see that CHD and CLL can also have a very large uncertainty and this pool to very high values that isn't even shown on the plot here because the central value is just so high, but the, the uncertainties are also very large. This indicates a flat direction in this combination that is lifted by the W measurement. So we see on the right here, all the possible 2D uh, slicings of this four parameter subset where the green shows the four parameter fit projected onto these 2D planes the purple shows the two parameter fit, and in beige, we see the fit with no W mass measurements. So the correlation is broken by the inclusion of the W mass, and the, the flat direction is what prevents us from having a sensible SMEF prediction in all generality without including W mass measurements. So it'd be interesting to see if there was a possibility of having a, some other constraints on maybe CLL from low energy precision data that could give an independent indirect determination of the range allowed by a W mass and determine other directions in this, uh, in this general SMEF analysis that could pool and agree well with the data. On the other hand, the 20 parameter fit uh, in electric Higgs and Di boson data doesn't have uh, much impact when we include W mass measurements. The reason being the uncertainties here are just much larger. So if we look at the 2020 fit that we did in our last paper and the 2022 fit shown in pink, then the pink and red bars are the ones that uh, are to be compared in these plots. And we see that there isn't much effect in the marginalization. And the four parameter subsets there are also shown for comparison. Uh, and we see that there are much more constrained in, in the subset. So perhaps in uh, other subsets, including uh, only electric position and Higgs and Di boson um, may be more interesting, but at the current uh, level of position of Higgs measurements and Di boson measurements, 
in full generality, uh, there is still not much impact. But perhaps with future measurements and future precision, this kind of analysis can lead to uh, a model independent correlations across uh, potential Higgs measurements. So this is something that people have started looking at and have, have already started discussing. In general, these these kinds of analyses, I think, are useful. Um, I, this is a perfect example of how a kind of anomaly or a shift in uh, certain me measurements can be best performed in a kind of Smith analysis in the most general way. Not only does it allow us to look at the data in, in generality for which directions new phys physics could pull in, but we can also more systematically survey all the possible UV completions and redo the fit very comprehensively and get their pools without having to consider each of them individually one by one. In this case, we take the three level single field extensions, make some simplifying assumptions on their couplings just for this uh, kind of toy model perspective. And this is listed in, in this paper here where we adopt their notation. So the relevant models that can generate these range from scalars, vectors, and uh, fermions with various quantum numbers. And the operators that they generate for the four by four subset are shown in the table on the left, where the ones with the wrong signs are crossed out. So we focus on the ones with the green ticks. The pools here are shown on the right. As expected, we uh, get the strongest pools for the ones that generate CHT, but we shouldn't neglect as well the ones that generate the other operators, which have been less studied in the literature. So this systematic survey can, can really um, tell us other interesting models that we should perhaps be identifying and looking at. For example, the right-handed uh, neutrino option is something that uh, pulls at five sigma. And um, I believe a paper yesterday studied this as well. So this is uh, all I wanted to mention. We have our best fit uh, masses here shown on the right, which uh, just like everyone else finds is in the TV range. This is four unit couplings of order one and the coupling range for a uh, mass of one TV. So this is uh, something that will be the subject of further study from the model building side. And on the SPEF side, I think a lot remains to be done as Mike pointed out to make these analyses um, a lot more solid and to um, perhaps identify other potential measurements that could help in either now or in the future with more precision to give some indication of whether or not this anomaly is indeed due to new physics or something else. So thanks. I want to leave a bit of time for, I don't know if there's any other, um, any other talks by other groups or Oh, we did. We're just we're just gonna have like one kind of fitting group talk because we thought it would be a bit redundant to have multiple ones. But just to just to address that point, there are a number of fitting papers from different groups that have come up this week. Of course, you can look at the All Things EFT website where we had them contribute slides, and you can just see their results there. If any of those fitting groups disagrees with Tamong and wants to get them into trouble, they're happy to. Uh, they're for, of course we're happy for them to speak up if they disagree with any of the analysis choices. Um, and just debate it. Uh, but uh, Tawang, I have a couple of questions, but maybe uh, we should let other people raise their hands first if they have any questions on what you said in terms of the way you did the data. I have a couple of questions, but are there any other outstanding questions from anybody else before? Yeah, I have a whole, just to be sure I understand. I mean, uh, Mike made a point uh, in his introduction that um, that one has to be careful to fit not just to the W mass, but depending on the type of measurement, there might be other modifications from the EFT to, to couplings. Um, and I was wondering uh, whether this is taken account in the fits that you've shown. I mean, particularly when you show that a single or, or two, you know, the two parameter fit, um, the two operator fit, uh, are you just fitting to the uh, the W mass and the other kind of basic electroweak, you know, through three other electroweak observables. Or are you actually looking at, uh, you know, uh, measurement by measurement what method was used and then um, adding additional parameters to describe those? So we are including uh, 
more than just the WMS and a few electric, we're including the full set of electric position observables and uh, well, die boson and Higgs, though they probably don't have much impact. And we do do the analysis in full generality. So each measurement does take into account all possible effects from this MEFT, um, as far as I'm aware, to the level at which we're working in. So linear dimension six interference with the standard model. So, so, so then, then let me, I'm just curious how you do these. Uh, in particular for the left two measurements, uh, Mike mentioned that uh, even the ones that Mike mentioned are safe, there's going to be some initial state, you know, radiation, which would br bring down the, uh, the central mass energy for the W per, um, which will involve those uh, S channel diagrams that Mike mentioned. Right. Um, and uh, so, and then you have to separate that diagram from the other one. And so how do you actually carry out the analysis? You have to get direct access to the data, I guess, do you? All right. So, uh, at the level at which we're doing this, it's uh, things like, um, for example, the, the biasing that uh, Mike talk, talked about in uh, the naive lab combination in SMEF, for example, is not something that we we looked at or included. Um, but at the level of how to extract the SMEF prediction from from Thai boson and WW and LEP2 and uh, all these other things is a question that you should ask Mike since we actually used his analysis and his results from his previous papers for these predictions. So a lot of these studies have been done for individual channels and different, uh, you know, in Higgs physics, there's uh, other predictions and other issues and uh, in Di boson as well. And all of these are taken from various studies and put into our into our fit. I can say well, a couple words on before, that to follow up. Hold on. Okay. Well, then I have another question, but then maybe after this question, I'm sure. Well, go ahead, Ben, if you want to say first. I can yeah, then I just have one other question, so. which is unrelated. Yeah, I also uh, want to weigh in as well. Um, so he's also on uh, part of our uh, fitting group, and he might know more about this aspect. Uh, Ken, did you have something to say of what Ben's already said, or shall we let him ask his next question, and then you can also chime in if you want? Yeah, it was just about Ben's initial question, just to clarify, I think uh, that those I think what he was asking about with these bias, potential additional bias effects associated to the actual method of extracting the W mass from a particular experimental analysis, uh, those things are not taken into account in our uh, fit. So, so, you know, we didn't do any explicit studies looking at exactly how the mass was extracted, but basically the introductory slides that, uh, that Mike mentioned. So, so we just take the measurements at, at face value, uh, assuming that there's no additional bias uh, introduced by potential Smith effects. So the only thing we include is, of course, then the, the way that this map affects all the various observables, assuming no bias in the extraction. Very good. So let me ask my other question. This is this is completely naive, but um, I suppose in the, the electroweak feeds use then uh, uh, the um, fine structure constant as one of the inputs, right? That's right. Um, yes. Um, and uh, so again, this is probably very naive, but I, I've heard some talks recently on tensions between different extractions of uh, uh, of, of alpha of the, of the fine structure constant. Um, and the tension is not just between g minus two of the electron, not of the muon, of the electron, which is incredibly precise, and uh, measurements in in, uh, in atomic physics. But actually, there's there's two different measurements from atomic physics uh, in terms of spectrum of some heavy atoms um, that, uh, that disagree with each other. And I think actually I believe the, 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 the inferred measurement of, uh, of the fine structure constant of G minus two is kind of sandwiched between the, the two atomic measurements that, that compete with each other now. Um, do you know whether that range of values of alpha uh, is, is large enough that it would accommodate the uh, this, this discrepancy or, 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 or is it much smaller and it doesn't really have any effect on this? Um, that's interesting, actually. I'm not sure if anyone has looked at that. 
So this uh, tension in the determination of the fine structure constant mm -hmm. is not something that is captured in our fit, as far as I'm aware, um, since we just used a fixed input parameter. And I don't know if, um, so for this green band that we show here is a green band of the standard model electroweak fit. And uh, this standard model point here is a PDG value with a fixed input parameter. And I guess your question is how how large is this uh, uncertainty or how much does this shift by um, given this yeah. tension? So if anyone knows, actually, I'd be curious to know as well. Uh, I could maybe say a word. So Ben, you're worried about the very low scale extractions, right? Um, well, the very the the low scale input because the yeah, input they, but it's, has a number from the PDG or something, and that number is is, is not well set. But the then I don't know whether the the difference in the competing values is so small that it's irrelevant for this. I don't know. That's why I was asking. So yeah. I would. So I think that if I think you're talking about the very low scale measurements, and then things are run up through the hadronic resonance region, and then the errors, and then the hadronic resonance region affects is I think dominating uh in terms of like the overall uncertainty on on alpha so i think it'll probably be that at the end of the day the errors that are incorporated are going to be big enough because they're, they're totally dominated by like the non-perturbative physics when you go through the hadronic resonant region not the intrinsic measurement error itself at the low scale which gets very very precise because it's like quantum effects mm -hmm. okay. So okay. I, I think it's probably okay for that reason i mean don't you minus two take uh the average of the of the two low energy uh, determinations that are in tension with each other, they take a wider uncertainty to account for that. I'm not sure of that. I don't know if anyone else knows. So if Maybe I could just tip in at this point, yeah, I think the discrepancy between the different values of alpha is very much smaller than the sort of scales at which we're talking at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember that the enormous magnetic moment of the electron is, you know, ways the precision is much greater than it is for the muon. And that's the level at which we're talking about uncertainty in alpha. Okay, I think that makes sense. Michelangelo, did you have a further comment as well? Yeah, it was just, uh, I believe that a couple of days ago on Monday, I saw a paper in which they were addressing this issue. And in particular, they were comparing uh, uh, the, 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 the the impact on MW of the alpha uncertainties in view of what these would have uh, caused to the G minus two. And uh, if I recall well, the two things go in opposite direction. In other words, if you modify alpha to, to, to get an improved agreement on the W mass, then the disagreement on G minus two become, becomes extremely large. And, uh, and vice versa, if you use that argument to improve on G minus two, you make it even worse here for the W. There is a competition between the two, if I recall well. But the, there is a paper in which this has been studied. I, I can try to find it out, but it was, I believe, Someone on Monday. Someone put it in the chat. Someone just put it in the chat. Yeah, but, but there they're talking about G mu minus two, not G E minus two. Yes, that was for G mu, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, are there any other questions for Tuong? I have a couple of comments I can make on what Ben was asking as well, just to clarify the, the measurement bias issue, maybe if, if no one else has any other has any questions at the moment. Okay, so let, let me just say a couple of words. And if people want to raise their hand and ask other questions, uh, please do please do feel free. Um, so just to clarify the issue I was raising in the introduction, and I hope it's clear now, there's two different issues and Ken was kind of, I think, uh, correct in kind of distinguishing between the two. So there's doing the actual SMEF prediction for a particular observable uh, at all, you know, having all the, the operators present, which is, I think, uh, the standard everyone agrees should be done. Uh, and then the, the global fit being done with all that, and then how you interpret the resulting fit space. And if you do marginalization, it is a question. But there's a second issue, which is what I was trying to essentially, uh, you know, emphasize at the start, which is that, you know, when you just take the experimental measurement itself, the experimental measurement is usually defined as like a standard model measurement. It's very frequently not thought of as a, as a SMEFT measurement. 
Uh, and, and then you have to worry about these other issues of other sorts of operator effects and other extra errors and these sorts of things that can show up in terms of that, that numerical value actually just being used directly, even though if, even if you're using a correct formula that's got all the operators at dimension six. And so again, just to reemphasize, I think that that is under control with respect to the, the template fit measurements of the Tevatron. And I think also probably for, for uh, Atlas and uh, measurements and also LHCB. But when it comes to the left two data and naive combinations people want to do, I think people should be very careful about those combinations. Because I think specifically, um, if you look at the details of some of the, uh, the left two data, what they actually did was they fixed the triple gauge coupling possible shifts to zero. They shift, they fixed the width shifts to zero, and then they did like a variation to extract essentially the W mass. And that's very problematic. It's because it's basically just inconsistent that data uh, done that way in terms of just a direct SMEFT interpretation if you just combine it in. So just, just to reemphasize, that's the issue. There's two distinct issues, doing the prediction with all of the operators being present, which I think everyone is doing now, and I think Tavong is doing now, and that and the fitting groups are doing. But then there's the issue of interpreting the measurements themselves, the naive combinations. So uh, Daniel, I think you wanted to, can you make a further comment? Uh, it's a question actually for, for Mike, for you. Um, <clears throat> basically on the second issue, right, which is that, well, we see the LEP measurement is somehow three sigma-ish uh, inconsistent with the new CDF measurement. Can that second issue make that consistent in some direction? And probably this is a question that can't be answered in five days or whatever, but uh, I yeah, don't know. So all I can tell you is I've, I've just taken a quick look and it's kind of interesting. If you look at the two different measurement classes I emphasized, the ones that are more consistent are the ones I think are less subject to other interpretational issues. And it goes kind of in the direction of being more consistent. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? But it's something that is something people should study in more detail. And the st statistical significance is, of course, marginal in the statement. But it's kind of just an interesting pattern in the data, I think. People should probably take the harder. As, uh, as Zoltan points out, though, the weight of LEP is, uh, is probably not important in this, right? Yeah, but if you're looking at intrinsic, so if you, I agree. So you did a global combination, the errors are so big, it's going to damp out. But then if you look at the skew of the central values, which you probably shouldn't, but if you did look at them, you might think, oh, that's also bad, right? Um, in terms of a couple of them being quite away from the, the CDF new measurement. But I think that the ones that are further away from lab two have more interpretational issues as well. So I think that it, it's kind of good news in some sense. Right. So there's, there's another question uh, in, in, in the chat of how Lambda is fixed in the EFT consider here. Maybe Tong, you, can you mention a little more exactly how you're presenting the results? Um, yeah, I'd uh, refer back to our previous bit paper from uh, 2020 for more details, but essentially what we're fitting is a combination uh, of the coefficient and the scale and the coupling. So when you see, for example, uh, these, these bar charts here, uh, the way you should read them is that uh, you can set lambda to one dV, and then that's the coupling range. And if you change the scale, then the couplings will change accordingly. On the right is the opposite. We fix the coupling to one, and then you can see the scale. But you can also see uh, in the dashed and the, the solid color the, the scale if the coupling were, were smaller or larger. So it depends on, on, your, on your model that we fit generally to the whole combination. I see. Uh, I have another question, come on. Uh, so you know, it's one. Is there someone else that had a question in the meantime? Okay, I'll just ask my question then. So for the values that are, so if you, so let's, if you take the, the measurement as indicating physics beyond the standard model and indicating the sort of from your fit where the sort of scales of suppression are for order one couplings. As you know, I'm a little bit obsessive about the fact that when you have lower scales, you have to worry about the dimension eight stuff in terms of interpreting electric precision data and, and these sorts of things. And also the loop effects, we have to also worry about those sort of things, all the sort of issues of consistency in this method pushing forward. So what is your sense in terms of how the fit is robust against those other sort of issues and errors or how it, do you think it can actually change any of the, the order one conclusions you're coming to in terms of it seems like these sorts of operators and then see, you know, then from them getting to the models, do you think it's like that big a problem or do you think it's going to be like a, a kind of a marginal interpretation issue if the scale is as low as a, you know, one to two TV or something? Right. I mean, as you say, I think it's uh, is a function of, of the scale at which you're you're at, depending on your coupling. 
So obviously, if you're going to loop level models, then this approach is going to break down. As soon as the particles go in the few hundred GeV range, then then one should do the full electroweak fit, including uh, the full contributions or um, essentially the EFT approach breaks down. But I think at this level, you know, we're talking about uh, multi TeV range. So for four to one couplings, I think this is robust enough as a as a first thing to do. And clearly, we'd want to improve on these kind of analyses in the future to make them to make them more accurate. But it's the kind of study which, uh, once we have a clear direction of which models we might want to look at, then we can do a full model analysis and look at the deviations from this kind of EFT picture. Okay, I think I would disagree a little bit on that. I think when it's around like one to two TV, there's some serious interpretational issues of electric precision data. That's that's a something Adam Martin and I and others are writing on. Um, and right, the order one. I mean, I would say there's some there's some uh, some things to take into account, as you say. But uh, but you were asking about whether it would change like uh, an order one conclusion. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, this won't give any deviation whatsoever, or you know, will be. So well, I don't, think, no, I don't think it'll make the deviation go away. I just did, like, do you think it can push in the interpretation direction in a, in a significant way? Uh, significant is relative. I mean, I think it'll play around with the pools, the best fit masses, the coupling range, and so on, mm -hmm. but um, but not to to a significant ex extent that it would uh, go from ruling something out to to saying this is the best fit or something like that. No, I Not think that's probably world. true. I think you're right about that. I, I think it's just it's a it's a, it's a line. Say, yeah. I think that that doesn't mean it's not important to do it uh, properly. But I think that's important when you have specific. Uh, you go beyond the sort of toy models and you know mm -hmm. first level analyses that we're doing here. So, did John, did you have a comment as well? Uh, so, I just wanted to mention that uh, Ken and I have a student who's looking at the stability of the uh, SMEFT approach when you go from dimension six to also including dimension eight. Uh, but this is uh, somewhat of a work in progress, but I think generally speaking, we find that results are, are pretty stable in the particular example we're looking at, although that might not be uh, a general conclusion. So we'd be very interested to uh, hear more about what you're finding. Yeah, so we've calculated the dimension eight result. There's a paper uh, in electric precision data has been calculated completely to dimension eight uh, about a year and a bit ago. I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, so there we just basically have the full formulas and then we would use sampling of the coefficients. The dimension eight effects on the interpretation of electric precision data look like they can be significant, but that's something that needs to be kind of fleshed out in more detail of how it projects into this particular measurement uh, for the W mass and the interpretation. Right. So uh, we have one other person who wanted to contribute one other group, actually, they want to talk about the PT modeling and how it can possibly be leading to an error that's larger than the experimental error. Now uh, they can only join in about 10 minutes. So we have about 10 minutes more of discussion on the SMEF and SMEF fits before they, they have a couple slides and a couple things they want to say. It's probably a very important issue in terms of the actual modeling of the signal in terms of the standard model. Um, and people are quite concerned about it. The, the PT uh, of the, the PDF fits. But are there any other uh, open questions or comments that people have on what's been discussed so far? Okay, if not, uh, Devang, I can ask other questions. Can you remind me about your fit in terms of how it treats the W width? So this input parameter scheme dependence, right, is, uh, is something that uh, is important for linearizing the contributions from the dimension six operators when we do, I think in the, in the Higgs side of things, this is more important. We have to be more careful in how we treat the, the contributions, which can be nonlinear, and then we have to linearize them by by fitting the results of the Monte Carlos. What do you mean by expanding out the propagator effect on the width? I meant something different. I meant in terms of the data you're using. Sometimes, so LEP also did fits to the width itself, the W width itself, for the the. So they took the same data 
and sometimes they they basically used to constrain MW, and other times it was used to constrain the width, um, which is another issue. <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly how uh, it fits in in terms of your fit. Did you guys use the quoted W width measurement at any time, or is it not present in in the fit results as an input? No, as like an data. Uh, I don't believe we have the the W width as an observable in our fit. No, at some point it appeared. Ken, do you know? Are you guys using the width at all? Or I don't do you think the width? W width is included as a, as a data point, no. No. It, it is or is not? I don't. Is not. Is not, is not included. So I'm, I'm cutting out a little. Okay. So you're not, okay, you're not including that. That's good. Standard like position observable set. Yeah, so can you define it in a little more detail as to exactly what's going into the fit currently? So the electric position observables are the, the ones reported by lab, right? I mean, I guess you're you're familiar with that slide since we did it in, uh, in, um, in your papers for the predictions there. The diposone are the WW, um, not the W as far as I recall. Uh, but the most is from the LHC is there. Yes, from the LHC, we use uh, WZ. From LEP, we use uh, LEP2, we use WW. Um, the most important over time goes on was the Z gamma. And then Higgs is uh, all the all the signal strengths and SCXS. Um, although the Higgs side of the input is is probably not relevant at this stage for the fit in, in the MW part of, of this. And then the W mass, as I mentioned before, is uh, in our previous fit was just Atlas and uh, Tevatron combination. But in this fit is the um, Atlas, LHCB, and the CDF combination with LEP and, uh, and D0. Okay, good. And can uh, you also... simply, simply stated, the, uh, the data set is the same as we had in our previous paper that came out at the end of 2020. Uh, in the uh, electric Higgs and Di boson sector, modulo the, the changes with the W mass that Tavon just highlighted. Okay, good. Yeah, I think it's important not to use the the W width as an input because there's the real inconsistency in how it's uh, at least if you're using it from from the uh, the lap two constraints on it because they're using essentially the same data that is using some of their W masses in their in their template fits. They're 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 basically using the same data set so. It's a bit challenging. Um, Perhaps I have an open question about um, we don't use sine squared uh, effective, for example. Um, and I think typically most people don't because there's some interpretational issues in the SMEF and the, the overlap with with other electric position observables. But I agree uh, with that, yeah. yeah, so I guess I was wondering to what extent it might actually be possible to disentangle these things and actually include it in, or is that just uh, or is it completely redundant because, in a sense, it's already taken into account in the other electric position observables? I, I think it's I think it's something you just cannot use, in my opinion. The the science can data effective. I think it's it's both things that you've mentioned. It's it's redundant. The correlations are kind of hard to define, and also the way the measurements are defined. It's it's just difficult, extremely so. Zoltan, do you have something to say? You're complaining in the chat. <laughs> One of the elephants in the room has many concerns expressed. I'm answer. not complaining. I'm just asking a question that I don't know the answer to. But I think that, you know, I have heard many, many concerns expressed about the analysis. So to me, the important question is this attention between different W measurements. So is this about the standard model's validity? But I don't have any deep insights. I mean, I think our our job as theorists is not to be armchair MW experimentalists and try to speculate on what they did wrong in that. I don't know. Until uh, until last week, I think none of us really knew anything about what went into this. Well, not any of it. But uh, um, so uh, just to uh, I don't know. Maybe some of the experimentalists are connected, and I I think Chris Hayes might be showing up around now. But um, my understanding, having talked to Chris about the use of these older tools, which is a concern a lot of people have raised up. Uh, is that essentially, as far as they're aware, the, the tools that they use are the ones that actually generate events with the corrections that they need to do the precision that they're doing. So if a theorist wants to provide other tools, more updated tools um, that can actually generate events, I think that the experimentalists would be very happy with that. 
but I think that that's, that's, that's somewhat of the issue. Uh, there's a lot of hands raised now, so are there other comments? So Chris will be giving a talk in, um, in an hour or so at the Santa Model at LHC. Yep. Well, he also was going to connect in here, I think, a little bit. If he shows, we'll see. But um, uh, Celine, do you, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think indeed the, the prediction they're quoting and the, the uncertainty they're giving. I mean, if you just do an A estimate, they're doing the 10 to the minus 4. So it for me means alpha electroic to the second power, so N and LO in QED, which is not even mentioned except for some photon uh, emission. And uh, for QCD, they're doing NLO, so that's 10%, and you need to go to the 10 to the minus four. I don't see how this can not be relevant. So I'm really hoping that eventually we will see those predictions. Well, not N N4 LO for, for QCD, but uh, I think there's a big worry about that. Uh, the other thing also, which was not clear for me from the paper, is how they're moving the W mass. If they're doing it with uh, assuming all the standard model uh, relation and to which order. Are they doing it at the leading order? Are you doing them at one loop, at two loops? Can I, this is Ashutosh. Can I make a couple of comments? For sure. Yes, please. I was hoping to, to talk to you actually. So. Yes, great. We can, of course, talk offline as well. We, we've heard these comments about the order of alpha S and so forth. So two comments there. One is whatever the theoretical calculation, including non-perturbative physics, resummation physics, fixed order physics, ultimately these are in some sense theoretical tools for us, but in some sense they're also parameterizations for us. And so what we describe and our previous papers also describe is that we are in some sense treating them as physics motivated parameterizations that are fit to the data. So let us remember that we have always used the Z boson PT spectrum as a constraint over a pretty wide range. Um, secondly, we have this time done an additional feature which is including the W boson PT spectrum um, as an additional constraint. So this is a new feature. So every caveat about what theory dependence there might be has to be cast as to what theory dependence remains after it is constrained by the data, not a priori. Right? So this is a crucial point which has to be realized. The second is what kind of MW is assumed in the fit. It is simply a bright Wigner parameter for us. It's a relativistic bright Wigner parameter for us. So it means that when you're changing the W mass, you're just changing the W mass. You're not changing uh, the couplings of the standard model G and G prime or G1, whatever you're calling them. You're just that, changing the W mass. Correct. Okay. Because we are completely decoupled from any rate issue, right? As, as was already mentioned, the spectrum that is fit to the data from the model of the experiment and so on, that spectrum is normalized to the data, no matter what fitting window is chosen. So we explore fitting window variations for checking experimental issues, but those are always, always normalized to the data. So there is no dependence on any rate, you know, of W production being higher or lower or anything like that. It's completely decoupled from the rate. So it is simply a, I don't know what the right word is. You can tell me it's some kind of pole position parameter in a relativistic bright Wigner uh, propagator. That's all it is. Okay, so it's really a shape measurement. There's no normalization measurement. There. Absolutely, that's, it is a pure yeah, that's the shape key measurement. Point. Absolutely the key point, yeah. Simone, did you have something to say as well? Well, maybe just an advertisement. Um, so we have an effort within the LHC Electro Week Working Group uh, on actually trying to combine. Uh, so this, um, this was uh, the Atlas and the Tevatron uh, MW measurement, the past ones. So this will be extended in the future to LHCB and the new CDF one. Um, but basically this is uh, exactly um, going to address the issues that were raised. So the, um, well, first of all, all of these measurements have been done with different uh, uh, parton distribution functions. And I think even the Tevatron combination between the previous result was not accounting exactly this uh, 
um, PDF correlation effects. Um, so this will be solved. And the fact that we have different uh, QCD models, uh, uh, this will also be um, accounted for. In particular, we are uh, working together with the Resbos2 people and uh, CP uh, who is providing us predictions. So all of these sort of question will be answered at some point in that context. Of course, it requires uh, quite a lot of work and is also a bit of a delicate uh, um, effort. So uh, this may not happen tomorrow. Okay, that's actually like the perfect possible segue to the last speaker who is going to talk about exactly sort of PDF effects. So Andrea, do you want to share some slides and, and make the points you wanted to make? Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Just a second. Okay. You should be able to share because I made you. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So you say a couple of words on, on the worry about the transverse momentum PDFs. Yes, exactly. So um, what I want to tell you is um, based on um, um, an analysis that we uh, published uh, uh, now, I think four years ago, which is uh, uh, sort of an investigation of what the impact of a possible flavor structure of the transverse momentum dependent distribution functions is on the termination of the W boson mass. So for those who are not familiar with the concept of the transverse momentum distributions, these are basically a, an extension of the standard collinear particle distribution function to a three dimensional uh, object in momentum space. So here we, we have a transverse momentum dependent PDF. You're not sensitive only on the longitudinal momentum fraction of a specific part on inside the hadron, but you're sensitive also to the transverse momentum of this quark uh, or gluon. So the idea is that um, uh, most of the determination of the TMD PDFs from uh, experimental data, so phenomenological analysis of these distributions, extractions of distributions from, from the data, they do not take into account a possible flavor dependence in the uh, transverse momentum KT of the quark. Uh, whereas we know, for example, that at the collinear level, these functions are, are deeply uh, flavor dependent. So the idea is to try to understand what the impact of this possible flavor dependence in the uh, quark transverse momentum is on the determination of the W boson mass. And the reason why we can, the reason for connecting uh, the flavor structure of the TMD PDFs with uh, the determination of the W boson mass is that the, the W boson mass is actually um, constrained starting from quantities that are sensitive to the structure of the TMD uh, distributions. So but, uh, let me make the point. So the, this is the determination of the W boson mass from the recent uh, CDF2 analysis which is in uh, a strong tension with the standard model expectation. And these, are, these two tables here collect the um, uh, determination of the W boson mass, starting, for example, from the transverse mass or the uh, electron transverse momentum uh, or the muon transverse momentum. So here I'm highlighting PT lepton, uh, electron and muon, just because I want uh, you to focus on, this, on the systematic uncertainties that are quoted for uh, this kind of uh, uh, quantities here, 11.8 MeV and 10.3 uh, MeV of systematic uncertainty. So if you look at the table two, you see that the uh, uncertainty uh, quoted um, arising from the modeling of the transverse momentum uh, dependence of the Z boson and of the uh, ratio between the W and the Z is actually quite low, uh, around uh, 1.3, 1.8 MeV, so up to 2 MeV, let's say. Uh, so the question is, um, can we claim, can we understand if these uncertainties are actually underestimated or not, given the fact that the TMD PDFs can be flavor dependent? So you can find the answer to this question in a couple of papers that we published in uh, 2018 and 2019. And uh, the analysis was performed together with my collaborators, Alessandro Bacchetta, Giuseppe Bozzi, Marco Radici, and Matthias Ritzman. So our finding is that uh, based actually on the kinematics of the Atlas experiment at 7 TeV, this is the kinematics where we uh, did our exercise, there is a, a, an additional uncertainty which has not been considered and has not been considered so far on the determination of the W boson mass that arises from the fact that the quark uh, intrinsic transverse momentum can be flavor dependent. 
And this uncertainty can range between minus six and nine MeV for uh, the W plus and minus four to three MeV for the W minus. And these numbers have a statistical uncertainty of uh, say uh, plus or minus 2.5 MeV determined from our analysis. So these, are, these numbers are significant, especially in light of uh, uh, the uh, recent analysis by the CDF2 collaboration. But also if you compare it to other sources of uncertainty, um, for example, the for loop QCD corrections, they generate a shift in the W boson mass of around two MeV, or the expectation from missing higher orders is around four MeV. So these uncertainties here are definitely comparable or higher with respect to effects that are considered, are currently considered in the analysis. So I just want to show you uh, why, uh, um, I mean, what happens if you, if you do your exercise considering the PT lepton distribution and the transverse mass distribution, distributions. So the transverse mass distribution on the right is deeply sensitive to detector effects, whereas it's weakly sensitive to the modeling of the uh, transverse momentum uh, of the W boson. So for example, let's look at the plot. The, the black curve should be the simulation um, related to uh, a W boson with no transverse momentum at all, so purely collinear. If you include uh, the fact that the a W boson can have a transverse momentum, then uh, the distribution is modified to the yellow one. If you include detector effects, then you go to the uh, uh, dot uh, uh, red uh, curve, which is I mean, pretty different from the previous ones. So you see that the transverse mass is actually very sensitive to the detector effects. Whereas the opposite happens for uh, the transverse momentum, uh, the PT of the lepton. So you see that it's moderately sensitive to the detector effects, and it's very sensitive to uh, the modeling of the PT uh, of the W and of the Z. So when I talk about the PT modeling, the PDW modeling, I mean both QCD radiative effects and non-perturbative effects, which can be related to uh, I mean the non-perturbative part of the anomalous dimensions that uh, let these functions evolve, or the intrinsic transverse momentum dependence, including the flavor structure of the TMD PDFs. So the way you connect uh, the cross-section differential with respect to the transverse momentum of the Z or the W with TMD PDFs more or less is the following really in a nutshell. So you have the convolution of two TMD PDFs, uh, F1 and F1 here, considering the work, uh, work and type work annihilation. And uh, uh, yeah, so in these functions here, you have uh, uh, the QCD radiative effects from the renormal renormalization of these functions, but you also have the non-perturbative effects associated to the transverse momentum uh, as well. So the strategy that we use to determine the impact on the W bus determination is a template fit, namely that we generated uh, pseudo data with a central value for the W boson mass and uh, flavor dependent parameters that describe uh, the intrinsic transverse momentum of the quarks. And we compare them uh, with uh, templates with less statistics, with, with, sorry, with higher statistics, uh, with different values of the W boson mass, ranging from uh, uh, plus, or minus, uh, plus or minus 15 MeV around the central value. And comparing pseudo data and the different templates, we determine that um, there can be an additional uncertainty on the determination of the W boson mass. Namely, there can be a shift in the value of the uh, W boson mass that you, uh, that you fix by looking at either the transverse mass or the PT lepton distributions. So you see from this table that actually our expectation is, uh, uh, was correct. We don't, see a strong, we don't see basically an effect on the transverse mass distributions, both for W plus and W minus, but we do see an effect for the uh, PT lepton distributions here. So uh, the core message of this uh, very short presentation is that the uncertainties associated to the PTW modeling, they can be significantly larger than one or two MeV if you consider the flavor structure of these distributions. And I, I say one or two MeV because these are the numbers quoted in the table that I showed you uh, a few minutes ago. And one and another interesting fact is that uh, the flavor dependence of the uh, quark transverse momentum can shift the uh, W plus and W minus masses into opposite direction. For example, if you look at the uh, set number three, which corresponds to a specific configuration in the flavor structure, you see that the shift on the W plus minus can be nine MeV, but the shift on the W minus can be minus four. 
So choosing one set or the other can help you either reduce or enhance also the difference uh, in the determination of the W plus and W minus masses. And so with this, I, I, I stop here, but of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be here to, uh, to discuss with you and receive input. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, and I apologize for connecting late, but uh, yeah. Uh, it, was, was, uh, it worked out perfectly fine. No worries whatsoever. Okay. Thanks for the last minute join in and, and slides. Uh, are there any questions? Anush, of course, go ahead. <laughs> or, uh, sorry, I mispronounced your name. But... Ashutosh, hi, no problem. Yes, Just sorry about that. Just a very quick clarification. These are for the LHC? Yes, yes, yes. So the idea is that, of course, so the exercise, as I said, was, uh, was done for the 7TV configuration with the Atlas kinematics. So it would be actually interesting to uh, see what happens for the uh, Tebatron configuration, of yes, course. That's right. So that would be really nice to see if you could do that. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. Yes, that was the... The, the clear comment to make. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just to be very clear. I mean, I think it's a it's a good physics point, but yeah, I think it needs to be. I assume you're redoing the analysis for Tevatron now, or? Yeah, yeah. We, we, it's in the yeah. We we would like to do it. Yes. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, ability to look at like consistencies or inconsistencies amongst the two different transverse variable distributions and the, and the relative sensitivities to basically see if for again, the Tevatron case that things are insensitive. Do you think that it actually would work out in terms of like a cross check? Just consistency of using the different sort of fits for the different kinematic distributions. So I don't, I, I yeah, on top of my head, I, I don't know. Um, so let me ask it a different way. If it was yeah. the case, this was a problem, do you think it would have already shown up in like an internal inconsistency in their analysis of the Tevatron, looking at the fits between the different templates? Like what's your sense of it? No, I don't, I don't think, no, no, I don't no. think so. So, because these are really, uh, I mean, if you, if you look just the, for example, at the acuity spectra, these are, these modification induce, um, so these effects, they induce a modification at the, I don't know, um, let me see, on the, um, so I thought you made the point okay. one spectra was quite sensitive, whereas the other spectra was not, at least for the LHC case. Yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly the case, and I would say I would say would assume it's the same thing for Tevatron for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it's possible it could just show up as an internal inconsistency when they compare the results of their template fits from one distribution to another. It could, could be. So actually, the plots that I uh, showed for the um, uh, PT and transverse mass distributions and the dependence on the um, uh, PTW or the detector effects, these are related to D0 uh, kinematics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, th this would be the Tevatron uh, configuration actually. And it's, we observe the same effects uh, at the LHC. Mm -hmm. I see, interesting, very interesting. Okay, are there any other questions? We don't want to go on indefinitely. Thank you very much. Uh, You're Andrea. welcome. Are there questions for Andrea or is there any other general comments or questions people wanted to make? Okay, I think we will probably cut it off there. So we're already a little over time. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, this was just an impromptu discussion. Uh, but I would note we'll, we'll be back in, in All Things EFT next week. Uh, and if you look on the website, you'll see we already have our first speaker uh, who's been announced. And uh, you'll hear more about the, the program coming forward for the next term. Thanks again for everyone for joining in and for all the last minute speakers. Thanks to Vong very much. Uh, and, and thank you, everyone. And we will hopefully see you next week. Thanks, Mike. Goodbye. Thank you.